Hello and welcome into episode 3 of the Lamberton Racing Pigeons podcast. We are here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, my name is Jeff Lamberton. I'm here with my dad, Dr. John Lamberton. How are you this morning? Good morning, Jeff. Doing great. Thank you. Our race season, Young Birds, is four weeks in now. And this morning, um, it really felt like fall, about 50 degrees. Uh, the temperature this morning, the birds had a lot of fun. And uh, this is my favorite time of year. How about you? Absolutely. I love the change of seasons in the spring and the fall. Well, since we are in Young Birds, we're going to cover a couple Young Bird questions sent to us uh, through email and on our Facebook uh, social media page. And uh, we're going to start with Jim, who asks, what system we use to race our Young Birds? So I'll hand that question off to you. Well, uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for that question. And Jim, um, there are probably any number of systems globally that uh, people use to race pigeons. Uh, I know in the Middle East and Asian countries and so forth, uh, they race pigeons much differently than we do here in the United States or in Europe for that matter. So the way I'm going to respond to the question is I'm going to respond in terms of the European system and versus the American system. And knowing that there are other systems out there that uh, I'm not as personally as familiar with. But because I've uh, traveled extensively and studied under some of the Belgian masters uh, and fanciers in Holland and Germany and so forth, I am more familiar with the European system. And then flying here in the United States, uh, obviously I know the American system. Uh, European young birds starts in the spring, in May and June, and uh, goes until September, October or so, whereas here in Tulsa and parts of the United States, uh, because of the weather, young birds tends to start the second week in September. Uh, that's when the heat uh, decreases, declines some, and you start to have the cold fronts come in and the temperature uh, cools down in Oklahoma so that we can race young birds. So in the United States, we start racing young birds in September, and in European countries, they tend to start racing young birds in, say, June, May, late May, early June. So one of the things that you want is uh, most of the fanciers, a lot of the fanciers in Europe race young birds on a widowhood system. And which requires uh, sexual maturity. So it's tough to fly a two or three month old pigeon on a widowhood system because they're not sexually active yet. So to fly the European system, pigeons have to be bred as early in the year as possible. So in Europe, most uh, of the fanciers, a lot of the fanciers, start raising birds and ringing them uh, in, in as early January as, as possible. And that's what we do here at Lamberton Racing Pigeons in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Is we couple our pigeons uh, the first week in December so that they'll hatch out about the 1st of January and be ready to ring uh, the first end of the first week in January. That way, when we do start racing them in the fall, they'll be as sexually mature as possible. And the one thing we're looking for in the Woodhood system is the motivation uh, uh, mating up. As you said, they have to be mature enough to handle that system. Uh, one thing you have to have, and uh, Larry asks, what kind of sections do we use for our young birds? So if we're doing Woodhood, we obviously have to have boxes versus perches. Right, and we can collapse our Woodhood boxes into uh, perch boxes. So uh, at a maximum, we, in our, one of our sections, we can have about 12 pigeons because we collapse. Uh, we have six widowhood nest boxes within each section, and each section's about uh, five feet wide and six feet deep. And then, of course, about six feet, three or four inches high. And we can collapse our widowhood boxes from the six boxes. We can split them in half. And therefore have 12 uh, perch boxes that we could put 12 youngsters in. 
But once we start flying them, once we pair them up and start flying them on Widowhood, then we open the boxes back up and we go from 12 birds uh, per section to 6 birds per section. So uh, it's primarily recommended that each pigeon have at least one cubic foot of airspace per pigeon in a section. I think a lot of American fanciers don't follow that rule and put a lot more pigeons in a section on small perches than one cubic foot per bird. And consequently what happens is they have overcrowding. Some of the birds are healthy, some of them aren't healthy. When they begin to train them out, the unhealthy birds get lost and they finally end up with the correct number of birds. But it wasn't because they planned it that way, it was because they lost the unhealthy pigeons. So actually we don't rely on the one cubic foot per bird. We go at a number much larger than that. So we put six pigeons in our section, uh, which works out to far more than one cubic foot per bird. And we do that for two reasons. Number one is we want the pigeons to have plenty of room, plenty of air. Uh, we don't want them to be overcrowded. But also pigeons are extremely territorial. In fact, that's one of their main motivating factors. Besides being motivated sexually by the nesting, the uh, the nest method of raising babies or, or going to flying to eggs or something like that. There's the woodhood system where they fly to their mates. But in addition, they're also flying home and they're flying to their nest box. And so nest boxes have to be uh, fairly large. Uh, in fact, the larger they are, the more motivation a pigeon tends to have because they have to defend a larger amount of space their, from their territory. Yeah, their territory from other pigeons. And uh, that's a harder job. It's much easier to defend one square foot than three square feet. So because it's harder for them and it requires more effort, they tend to be more territorial, uh, more defensive, and therefore more motivated to come home to their to, and defend their territory. One thing young birds have to do, uh, have to be taught at a young age, is trapping. So uh, one of the things that we like our pigeons to, to do is to know us, know our voices, and trap whenever we call them in. And Jerome asks, what uh, is the best method to get the young birds to trap quickly? And I think, uh, like I said, feeding a feeding system, calling them in, having them know you, more so than uh, feeding them in a feeder and, and, and walking away and letting them eat out of a feeder more so you know feeding them out of your hand getting that relationship with them that'll help get your birds trapping quicker absolutely the there's uh, a tremendous advantage that fanciers have when they do have a relationship with their pigeons pigeons are a social animal and they do like uh, other pigeons they they do like people and uh, they learn uh, attachments to 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 a space to other pigeons and they learn attachment to the people that care for them, the, the, the fancier. So that um, you have to develop that relationship and when you feed in a hopper uh, you're not taking advantage of the time with the birds that you could take if you fed them by hand. Now some people may have to do that, they work, they've got to get their kids to school, uh, there may be people that work two jobs or whatever and so just because of time they have to cut corners and feed in hoppers and not spend as much time with their pigeons and so forth. Of course, in, in that situation, what I would recommend is that they have fewer pigeons because it takes less time to take care of a few pigeons than it does a lot of pigeons. So in our blogs and in our writings, people know just from the way we write that we are uh, we fly a small team. We do that for a number of reasons, and it's not because we don't like flying a lot of pigeons. Uh, there are many re other reasons, and maybe we can get that to that in another question or another podcast because that's a rather complicated question. But yes, to, in order to get birds to trap, you have to develop a relationship with them. You have to be able to call them in. And my uh, mentor, uh, who you knew as a small child, Jeff, and and uh, you've been mentored by him uh, when you were little, uh, 
is Antoine Jacobs of Worselaar, Belgium. And Antoine stressed that uh, at an early age, you have to be very strict with young birds in terms of not overfeeding them and getting them to come to you when you want them to and when you call. So he would feed his birds uh, several times a day uh, just with a handful uh, of grain at a time calling the birds to them. And if, and if you have the time to do that and can go in the loft uh, five, ten, fifteen times a day, and every time you go in, you sprinkle a small handful of feed down and call the young birds, then that many times per day, they're learning through stimulus response and the Pavlovian theory to, to come when they're called. And so we teach our young birds to trap and to come in, uh, as from, from the time they're weanlings, uh, on to, to when they're actually older young birds. We don't wait until they've already gotten old enough that it's hard for them to learn. We teach them, uh, even in the nest, uh, when we feed in a cup in the nest, we'll, when we feed their parents and feed them, we'll call and, uh, or whistle or we, we call, some people whistle. But we do that even when they're two or three weeks old in the nest and they learn from a very, very early age that there's a connection between calling and being fed. And it's kind of like a basketball player shooting free throws, just those mental reps. And as many times as you can do it throughout a day, the more mental reps it'll give the pigeon, the muscle memory, and it'll uh, give him that stimulus to come to you when you call. And and the more you do it, the more that they'll end up flying on your shoulder. They'll fly on your legs and land on you. They'll they'll be uh, much more comfortable with you, and they won't be fearful, which also helps. Absolutely. In fact, when we scrape the the uh, we feed all our pigeons in a foyer uh, that they can all have access to, and and we scrape the foyer and clean it very carefully, and then we sit down on the uh, foyer floor. And we actually spread, can spread the grain over our legs, over our feet, and our ankles, over our, our body, so that the pigeons actually have to crawl up on us in order to get some of the grain. And by doing that, the pigeons develop a relationship with you. They overcome their fear, and they actually uh, become quite tame. And I've seen pictures of fellow fanciers who have the bird call, and the birds will come on their shoulders, or there are fanciers that teach them to... Uh, enter uh, a carrying crate uh, by themselves by simply calling them and they've taught them uh, they fed them in the carrying crate and the birds learn when he calls to actually go in to the, to get the carrying crate because they're, they're going to be fed so there's a number of the pigeons are very smart and there's a number of things that you can do with them if you start them from a very very early age one thing that Juan emailed us and asked us about was when is it time to take the young birds on their first training toss on the road? When do you know that it's that they're ready to be in the shipping crate and to go on a training toss? Well, the standard answer to that question would probably be when they start routing, uh, when they're roughly uh, three months old. Uh, when they're a month old, they'll sit out on the landing board or sit on the top of the loft. Uh, as they're two months old, they'll, they'll start flying and they'll eventually pack up and, and fly in flocks versus, uh, singular pigeons flying every which direction. And, uh, after a couple of months, they flock up and then by three months, they should be routing. Uh, and if they're not routing, uh, because the weather's hot or humid or there's some other reason, uh, we'll generally start, uh, training in the, in the truck, uh, in the automobile, in any event, because uh, if they're not routing, then training actually will encourage them to route. And so the answer to your question would be, ideally, would be that would be routing at three months. We would start training them then. But if they're not routing, we don't wait. We go ahead and start training them anyway. Now, when we do train them, we may train them slow, slower if they're not routing and not jump out uh, to 20 miles or something like that. If they're routing, that means they're traveling a long way from the loft. They're gone for 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour. 
which means they're traveling a far distance from the loft. If they're simply flying around the loft at three months and they're not really routing, then they haven't had that exposure to a distance that they would have if they were routing. So in that case, we actually start training just a few miles at a time and ease our way into 15 or 20 miles away. But if they're routing, you could start them at 10, 15, 20 miles without much difficulty. And the final question we have for this podcast, episode three, uh, Randy writes that he has been doing most of his training in the in his truck by himself, and he said uh, that he's heard about other fanciers training together and, and training their birds together. He just was wondering if there is an advantage to training with another fancier. Absolutely. Uh, we initially do train by ourselves, but once we have a good foundation on our young birds, they're trained out to 50 miles. Uh, we train in all directions. Uh, that's because uh, pigeons come home from all directions. Uh, maybe they overfly and have to come back. Maybe the wind pushes them east or west, and so they'll loop in from the east or the west. Uh, birds don't always or maybe seldom fly directly on the line of flight, but people think that they they have to train them exactly on the line of flight, and that has not been our experience. We train them around the clock. We, when we turn a bird loose, we want a thinking bird and not a reacting bird. So that uh, we train around the clock. And once we've trained them around the clock to about 50 miles, then we really like to double toss with another fancier. And essentially that means turning one of our birds loose and the other fancier turns one of their birds loose. So that our bird will have to learn to break as an individual pigeon from another individual pigeon in order to go home. And initially they may not do that. Maybe uh, our bird will go to the other fancier's house, or the other fancier's bird will come to our house, but after one or two tosses like that, they do learn to break. And that process of learning to break is one of the most important processes in racing young birds. And you took the around the clock and, and teaching them not just to be on the line of flight, but to train around the clock. You took that with you when you flew in Belgium, and uh, it worked well for you on your first race there in Young Birds, right? Absolutely. Uh, fanciers in Belgium don't train that way. Uh, my partner there, Jeff Kuypers, uh, told me that, that no one did it that way, and uh, he didn't want me to tell anybody. Uh, so I didn't. Not... Uh, I don't speak uh, Flemish uh, or Dutch, so uh, some, unless someone spoke English, I had a hard time communicating with them anyway. But uh, I would go over and, and couple the pigeons, uh, couple the young birds with old birds. I would get them uh, trained in their nest boxes. I would train them around the clock. Uh, Jeff and his family would be on holiday, and uh, I would sometimes stay at their house or, or, or somewhere else at a hotel. And I would spend a month uh, putting the basics on them and get them ready for the, the races. And uh, in 2006, I believe it was, uh, Jeff didn't come back from his holiday until uh, the first two races had been flown. And I flew those two races by myself uh, with those pigeons. And uh, we won both of the two races that we flew in. Uh, the first time uh, we took the top four positions and the second time we took the first position and were actually 10th overall against yearlings and old birds. And uh, the Belgian fanciers uh, in that club were amazed at how well trained our young birds were uh, from the very first race on and they were very impressed as to how uh, I was able to do that, and like I said, uh, I never discussed that with anybody, but uh, I was very pleased that they seemed to be happy with the way the birds looked because I didn't want to embarrass myself or uh, embarrass our partnership or whatever by taking young birds to the race that couldn't compete because that's probably what all the Belgian fanciers expected was that someone from America couldn't be competitive. Uh, in a country such as Belgium, but uh, we were extremely competitive, 
and it, as far as I'm concerned, only con reconfirmed our training methods as being some of the best training methods in the world. And that'll do it for Episode 3 of the Lamberton Racing Pigeons Podcast. You can find our YouTube videos, our blogs, our podcasts, our race results. Uh, any information you're looking for can be found at our website, drjohnlamberton.com. We're on Facebook at Lamberton Pigeons, Twitter, Lamberton Pigeons. We'd love to hear from you. Email us. Send us a Facebook message with your questions, and we'll get to them on future podcasts. Thank you so much for listening, and have a great day.